Hello, Calculus AB students, and welcome to our final video review going over 2020 practice, practice exam number three, which I posted Sunday morning. So hopefully you all got a chance to try this as one last final review before your exam on Tuesday. All right, so just to start here, you notice all these practice exams we've done so far are following this format with the two questions. Um, one question stem always involves a graph somehow, and a second question stem, as in question two here, involves a table of values. So I'm guessing that's what your exam is going to look like on Tuesday, uh, following that same format. And that's with the College Board, the uh, exam they they sent also had that format. So uh, where you know they can ask you something about areas under the graph and slopes as far as using the derivative and the integral, and then um, using table of values, you know you're going to approximate an area with the Riemann sum or trapezoids. You're going to approximate slopes to tangent lines, things like that. Okay, so um, anyways, let's start off with uh, AB1 here. You're given a graph of a function f shown above, and um, the areas under the curve are given there. And uh, the function h of x is defined as a piecewise function. It's x squared plus x minus 2 when x is less than negative 1. It's g of x when x is between negative 1 and 11, where g of x is defined as the integral from 2 to x of f of t dt. So pay very close attention because there's three different functions going, going on here. Um, and um, g involves f and h involves g. So there's a lot going on here. So just again, pay close attention to what function is, it's discussing um, in the problem. So for part A, show that h is continuous at x equals negative 1. And the last couple of exams we've done have all had a definition of continuity on there. So hopefully by now you all know what to do, right? You want to um, show two things are equal. Show the limit as x approaches negative 1 of h of x equals h of negative 1 equals the value. So, and to find the two side limit, you have to find the left and right hand limit. So find both of those. And make sure you write your answer with limit notation. I cannot stress this enough. Make sure you show the proper limit notation. Limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left of h of x. Well, it's a piecewise function. So to the left, I'm going to plug it in this function, and I get negative 4. Limit as x, x approaches negative 1 from the right of h of x. From the right, I'm going to use the function g of x. So what is g of x? g is a integral from 2 to x f of t dt. So g of negative 1 is the integral from 2 to negative 1 of f of t dt. So the integral from negative 1 to 2 is 4. But since this integral is going backwards, the answer is negative 4. So both the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit as x approaches negative 1 of h is negative 4. So my two-side limit is negative 4. Now, what is the value of h of negative 1? Well, h of negative 1 is the same as g of negative 1. So it's the same as the right-hand limit. So it's also negative 4. So there you go. So h is continuous because the left-hand limit, I'm sorry, the two-side limit um, as x approaches negative 1 of h of x equals h of negative 1. That's what you need to show. All right, um, part B, order the values of these, h double prime and negative 2, h double prime and 2, h double prime and 10, from smallest to largest. Explain your reasoning. Okay, anytime you see a question like that where you have to put three values in order, there's a very good chance one of them is going to be positive, one of them is going to be negative, and one of them is going to be zero. Then you can line them up in order. So you don't even have to necessarily find all the values. If you can just show which one's positive, negative, zero, you can put them in order. Okay, and when it says explain your reasoning, you don't have to write it out in words. Just show how you found those values, and then the, the answer is obvious from there. All right, so um, we'll ask about the second derivative. Well, first I have to find the first derivative, and once again, since it's a piecewise function, I have to do the derivative in two parts. When x is less than negative 1, I just take the derivative of that function, 2x plus 3. When x is greater than negative 1, the derivative of g is g prime. And then second derivative, when x is less than negative 1, derivative of 2x plus 2 is 2. And then when x is greater than negative 1, the derivative of g prime is g double prime. So I've got a piecewise function for this second derivative. So let's find these three here. h double prime and negative 2. Well, since x is less than since negative 2 is less than negative 1, it's just going to be 2. Now, h double prime of 2 is going to be the same as g double prime of 2. Well, how does g and f relate? Well, let's go back here. Since g is the integral of f, that means that f is the derivative of g, right? f is g prime. And so therefore, f prime is g double prime. So when I'm talking about g double prime, I want to look at the slope of f. Remember, the we're given the graph of f in the top. I want to look at the slope of f. So let's go to 2. The slope at 2 is negative, right? It's decreasing. So the slope at 2 is negative. Let's go to 10. 10, there's a horizontal tangent. So the slope at 2 is 0. 
So there you go. I've got that H double prime of negative two is two. H double prime of two is negative. H double prime of 10 is zero. So there you go. From smallest to largest, it's um, H double prime of two is less than H double prime of 10 is less than H double prime of negative two. Okay. So that's what you had to show for part B. Part C, evaluate this limit or state that it does not exist. Okay. Anytime you have to evaluate a limit, you're probably going to have to use L'Hopital's rule. Not always, but you can, I would definitely always expect to see that. So let's check and make sure that we have to use L'Hopital's rule. You remember, first you show that's true. Plug six in the numerator and you get G of six plus three. Uh, again, remember G of six, let's go back to the integral. G of X is integral from two to X. So G of six is going to be the integral from two to six. Since the three is below the X axis, G of six is negative three. Negative three plus three is zero. And then um, plug six in there, obviously that's going to be zero. So now we're going to do L'Hopital's rule, which means we're going to do the derivative of the numerator over the derivative of the denominator. Derivative of G is G prime. Derivative of three e to the 12 minus two X is three e to the 12 minus two X times negative two because of the chain rule. Derivative of X squared is two X, okay? And then we can plug in six to get G prime of six, um, which again, G prime is the same as F. G prime is the same as F. So go to the graph. F of six is zero. I get that from the graph. So it's zero minus six over 12 or negative one half. So there's your limit, negative one half after you use L'Hopital's rule. All right, um, part D, evaluate this limit. Okay, you have to do a definite integral. And since there's a inside function, I'm gonna have to use U substitution. So here we go. All right, so my inside function is 2x minus 4. So I'm going to let u be 2x minus 4. du is 2dx. Plug in 1, plug in 7, I get negative 2 and 10. Okay. And again, quick reminder, if it's a definite integral, if you put the um, plug in u and du, always change these values from x values to u values. Then you don't have to plug the x back in. Okay. So what I have now is... Um, I'm going to replace 2x minus 4 with u. I'm multiplied by 2 inside, so I have to put a 1 half out front. So it's going to be 1 half integral from negative 2 to 10. 3 times h prime of u plus 5 du. All right. So do the antiderivative um, of that is going to be 3 times h of u plus 5 times u. Notice it's not 5 times x, right? It's 5 times u because that integrals in terms of u. Plug in 10 and plug in 2. So I have to find h of 10 and h of negative 2. All right, so I'm going to have to go back to the function, how h was defined. Remember, um, h of um, negative 2, I'm going to plug in here, and I get negative 4. Okay, h of 10, since 10 is bigger than negative 1, I'm going to plug in the integral from 2 to 10. So it's going to be 2 minus 3, so it's going to be negative 1. So that's how I got these two values. I work on the side, it shows you that. That's what I'm going to plug in. So I'm going to plug in negative one for um, h of 10, plug in negative four for h of two, negative two, and then you can just see the arithmetic there, okay? Um, and reminder, on the AP exam, you can stop right here. It's perfectly fine. You don't have to simplify that. You cannot stop here. You have to plug in those values. But once you get the numeric values like this, you don't have to do arithmetic. You can stop there, okay? And then um, E, um, solve the differential equation. Find the particular solution to differential equation. That means solve the differential equation. Okay. So um, we're going to separate the variables, separate the x and the y's. All right. Um, so every time you see a differential equation, you solve it by separating the variables. All right. So here we go. Um, First thing I'm going to do is separate, again, divide by y minus 1, multiply by dx. Do the anterior of both sides, ln of y minus f divided by y minus 1. Anterior of h prime of x is just h of x, okay? And then I plug in my initial condition to solve for c, okay? Um, and I'm going to get um, c is h of negative h of negative 2, which, again, go back to your division of x of h of x, and you can get it as 4, right? Because h of negative 2 was negative 4, so that's going to be 4. And then I plug the 4 back in for c, and I solve for y. Um, and there's all my algebra. Okay. And once again, when you drop the absolute value, double check because the answer is positive, I can leave the right side positive and then solve for y. There you go. So there's your answer for the differential equation. All right. Now, on to problem number two.
Um, on to problem number two, as I said here, they're going to be they're going to give you a table of values. They're giving you a table of values, um, and for f prime between negative two and ten, and notice they tell you that f double prime is positive. That's going to come up later. There's a reason they tell you that's going to come up later, um, and they also give you the initial condition of f. F of seven is four. So approximate f double prime of negative one. Is there a time in there when the derivative equals that? Justify your answer. Okay. So. Um, F double prime of negative one is going to approximate the slope of F prime near negative one. So pick the two points near negative one, zero, negative two. Okay. And you get those two points, plug them in, take the slope there, and you get three. Okay. Um, now, is there a time between there when F prime of C equals this? Now, uh, some of you stu students were using the mean value theorem. I know that looks like a mean value theorem because you want to show it's equal to a derivative, but be careful. The values here are the derivative. So you're not showing that it, the slope there equals three. That's what this is. You're showing that the value of the derivative there equals three. So that's actually the intermediate value theorem. That's the intermediate value theorem. All you have to do is state that F prime is continuous because it's differentiable. Since F prime is continuous and we know at negative two, it's eight. And, or sorry, that should be a negative eight. At negative two, it's negative eight, and at seven, it's 11, and at three is somewhere between negative eight and 11. That means somewhere between negative two and seven, f prime of c equals three. So once again, because you're only dealing with the values of the function, you're not dealing with the slope or the derivative of f prime, you're just dealing with the values of f prime, it's the intermediate value theorem we're gonna use here. All right, um, for part B, evaluate this integral, show the work. So once again, that's a u substitution problem. Okay, because there's an inside function. So I'm going to let u be x squared minus 2. And then I can find my du. And just like before, change the 0 and 3 from x values to u values. And then you do the, um, write it in terms of uh, u. Now I have to multiply by 2 inside, so I put a 1 half out front. That 5 is not helping me, so put the 5 out front as well. Make it 5 halves out front. Integral f double prime of u, which is f prime of u between 7 and negative 2. And then you plug those in, um, get those values from the table, and there's your answer, uh, 95 halves. Or once again, you could just stop. Um, once you get to this value here, it's fine. 5 halves times 19. All right, part C. The function g is classified by this, f prime of 2x cubed minus 9x squared. Find any critical values of g, classifies the local max, local min, or neither. Okay, so critical values, that means when the derivative equals zero. So I have to find g prime, the derivative of g. Okay, so I have to use the chain rule here. g prime of x is the derivative of f prime is f double prime, inside stays the same, times the derivative of the inside. Okay, now I want to find when that's equal to zero. Well, obviously that's a polynomial, I can factor that. But what about this? When is that equal to zero? It's never equal to zero. Like, how do I know? That was this at the beginning. They told me f double prime of x is always positive. It's never zero. So the only zeros of this of this function come from the zeros of 6x squared minus 18x, which you can factor that and you get zero and three. And then you make your sign chart. And notice this is always positive. So just whatever the sign chart is for 6x times x minus three, that's not gonna change it. Positive, negative, positive. And remember, a sign chart alone is not justification. You have to write out in words. So g has a maximum of zero because g prime changes from positive to negative. And g has a minimum of three because g prime changes from negative to positive. So make sure you write out your answer in words like this, or you will not get credit. You need to explain your reasoning in words. All right, the uh, part D. Here's the left Riemann sub and four summary rules to estimate f of zero. Is it overestimate? Give a reason. Okay, so this is where I'm going to use uh, the final theorem calculus once again, all right? Because I know f of seven was given and I wanna find f of zero. So I'm gonna set up an integral. f of zero is gonna be f of seven plus the integral from seven to zero of f prime of x dx. All right, now, um, how am I gonna evaluate this integral? Well, this is where the left Riemann sum comes in. I've got selected values for f prime. So I'm gonna use a left Riemann sum to approximate this integral. Now, some of you are saying, why do I use four sub intervals when there's five intervals there? Notice, I only want to go from zero to seven, right? I'm only approximating the integral from zero to seven. So I only need to use these four intervals. These values don't matter, just these four intervals from zero to seven, okay? So 
I can approximate the integral from 0 to 7 of f prime x dx with a left Riemann sum, which is what I did here, and I get 28. Okay. Now, notice this integral is backwards, right? So when I plug it in, I'm going to subtract it. I'm not going to add it. I'm going to subtract it. So it's going to be 4 minus 28, which is negative 24. So the approximation for f of 0 is negative 24. Now, is that an over or underestimate? Well, let's see here. Um, what do we know? F prime is increasing, tells us in the problem. Since F prime is increasing, okay, our F double prime is positive, that means F prime is increasing. So the left Riemann sum is an underestimate. Right? Again, you can draw the graph. If you have an increasing function, the left Riemann sum is an underestimate. But be careful, we're not done. It didn't ask me if this was an underestimate, it asked me if F of zero was an underestimate or overestimate. And be careful. This integral is being subtracted, right? Notice it's being subtracted from four. So if this is too small, if you're subtracting a number that's too small, that means your answer will be too large. So f of zero is actually an overestimate. So you had to sort of do, um, take it one step further than just the integral. You had to think about how the integral interacted with the problem to get f of zero. So f of zero is an, um, or that answer is an overestimate for f of zero. All right, finally, part E. Uh, it gives you a slope field there for those three points. Draw the slope field. Um, there we go. Just plug the points in the derivative. Okay. And then uh, it says use the tangent line to h at x equal 2 to approximate h of 2.1. So I have to find the tangent line. Okay. So tangent line, remember, we need a slope and a point. It gives us the point. All right. Just plug the 2 and the negative 1 into the derivative to get the slope. And then draw a right true equation for your tangent line. And then... Um, Solve for y if you want to, or you can do it later, doesn't matter. And then I plug in 2.1 for x, and I get negative um, 1.1. So there you go. That is your approximation. All right. So uh, hopefully that helped you go through those answers. And you sh um, should have uh, plenty of other problems to work on now. So if you need more practice, I've got another practice exam. I've got uh, videos I posted over the weekend from other teachers going through practice problems. So plenty of work to do. All right, so a couple last minute suggestions before the exam on Tuesday. My, I suggest that all of your students take a few sheets of paper, put your APID number and your initials at the top of the page, like it said, and then um, write out ahead of time, question one, part A, part B, maybe do two parts for problem. Do another page, question one, part C, part D, do the same thing for question two. Have it all laid out and ready to go. That way when the exam starts, you can just write in your answers and all everything else is there for you. Also, it's a good idea, that way, if you want to skip uh, an answer, let's say you get stuck on part B, you know, skip it. Don't spend too much time. Go on to part C and part D. And when you come back, if there's time at the end, you come back and, and work on part B again, and there'll already be um, space there for you. So you'll leave enough space to work on your on your answer. And then um, I said, uh, make sure you try all the problems in the time allotted, okay? You don't want to leave the last one blank just because you have time to get to it when that's the easy part. Try all the problems. Don't spend too much time on one part if you get stuck. Right. They said they're going to make the test plenty long. You might not get it all done, uh, all parts of it all done. That's okay. Just try as many, try, try to attempt all of them. So at least you know the easy ones, the ones you can do, you can get those done. Okay. And I have some more information I'm posting later just about um, how to upload your answers. As I said before, make sure that you try the demo website. Just make sure you are, you're ready for Tuesday for the exam. We don't want any technical glitches. So good luck to you all. And I'll be thinking of you Tuesday. Bye-bye.